Hello, hello everyone. My name is uh, Nikita Lomagin, as uh, Daniel already told you. I'm a, a professor at European University, a historian and lawyer by background, but teach a lot of uh, international political economy and uh, political science. And today uh, uh, I will present you with maybe two uh, uh, well-connected uh, issues which might interest uh, not only Russian students but foreigners for sure. It's uh, Russian energy as it is and Russian foreign policy, right? So I think that those who would like to grasp what Russia is doing, uh, why Russia is doing, uh, why Russian foreign policy is becoming more and more uh, assertive as some people suggest, they have to think about uh, various foreign policy tools Russia has at its disposal. And if you look at debates uh, over Russia, Russia's energy politics, uh, many people would say that uh, uh, Russia is uh, a country which unfortunately departed from democratic past, went to its traditional roots of uh, authoritarian uh, development, and such kind of people look at the correlation between uh, price on oil, basically, and the way how democratic institutions develop. So the lower prices on oil, the less oil rent you have, the less you can please your constituency, the better chances that you will think for improvement of institutions, and sooner or later you will change those institutions in order to foster competition, in order to foster political competition, and you will back on the right track. So this is uh, basically the mantra for those who uh, think about uh, loss of so-called petropolitics. Uh, Friedman from the United States, a famous author, puts Russia in the category of petrostates, uh, and many others in the United States do more or less the same. And they discuss uh, oil curse or petrostate as uh, uh, basically the fate of Russia. That again, sooner or later, Russia will end up with just one sector in its economy, and this sector will be oil or natural gas or both. And the uh, Russian economy will be shrinking with time being, and uh, eventually the country with great ambitions will collapse, as it happened with the USSR. Right. So again, it's a very no, you know, gloomy scenario, and I, I will do my best to, you know, try to figure out uh, what's happening with Russian economy, with Russian energy sector, whether it's as simple as some uh, famous professors, including those who teach at Harvard University, Marshall Goldman, for instance, the author of this book titled Petro State, said. Many experts in the West, in Washington, D.C., in uh, Pearson Institute and Brookings Institute, uh, they look at decline or they expect a decline of uh, Gazprom or Rosneft or uh, Rosatom, uh, national energy companies in Russia, and they see that, again, uh, this decline would mean a uh, decline of Russia as such, because the uh, energy sector is viewed as a main cash cow uh, for the country. So less revenues from those uh, companies less capability for uh, ambitious uh, Kremlin. Others are talking about three colors of Russian energy. Uh, I don't know whether you are familiar with works by uh, Professor Gustafsson from uh, uh, Georgetown University. He's speaking about, you know, uh, brown, uh, green, and blue. Brown goes for uh, those fields which are Depleting, which means that you have to invest quite a lot in order to uh, gain uh, remnants of oil in those depleted fields. Or you have to develop new ones, green fields, but those fields are far away from traditional uh, pipeline system. You have to invest again quite a lot. You have to go to uh, uh, Eastern Siberia, you have to go to Russian Far East, and you will look for uh, substantial investments, and who will give you this money? This, this is a huge question mark. And the third color of Russian oil is blue, which goes for Arctic. Again, very expensive, uh, technologically demanding, etc., etc. And the key issue is, without 
favorable external conditions, Russia would be unable to keep its production level of both oil and natural gas in the foreseeable future. And Gustav though he is maybe the best Russian oil historian. He uh, also quite pessimistic about the future of Russian energy sector. So all of, all of those guys or uh, basic approaches which I already mentioned are quite negative and pessimistic. And uh, some people, Margarita Balmaceda, she published recently in Toronto University Press a book uh, with just one uh, main point that uh, Russia is using uh, energy as a new weapon, as a major instrument of Russia's foreign policy. Right? And Russia is quite successful in countries like Belarus. Russia has failed with this energy weapon in Lithuania because of European Union, etc., etc. And Russia basically corrupted Ukraine, which is uh, in this corruption trap uh, for uh, you know, the last decade or so. Uh, energy and foreign policy. How energy and foreign policy are uh, linked? So, again, I don't know how many of you took classes in political science, but just, you know, very shortly, just give me a couple of minutes to uh, introduce you uh, the traditional approach to put business sector energy as a business. Uh, we assume that those who uh, invest money in the oil sector and gas sector, they do it uh, just for the sake of making more money, not just uh, to use it as a foreign policy tool. United States does this, uh, you know, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia is not an exception, Norway. So we look at uh, uh, so-called levels of analysis, we look at the position of the country at the international stage and external pressure being put on this country and the need of country to react somehow. So there are numerous challenges uh, to uh, Russia, which is in terms of the size of its economy is rather small, number 11 according to World Bank in absolute terms, and number six if we use PPP standards, purchasing power parity, but again, 11, right? And the share of Russia in the world economy is just 3.5%. Uh, at the same time, ambitions well exceed this 3.5%, right? And the key question, the key puzzle is how you can play with so weak cards, so strong, and for, for, for quite a while, right? So, uh, international system, we look at structures of power within the state, we look at regimes, we look at institutions, we look at major uh, partners who basically pay you cash for your oil, gas, coal, electricity, etc. So we are, in other words, are dependent on those markets. So in uh, this uh, analysis, when we look at international system, we are mostly interested in markets, in market access, in transit states in uh, financial flows which might come to us in technological uh, advancement with the help of these uh, external uh, players. Or you can be rejected, money, you can be rejected, uh, technology can, re can be rejected, uh, your ability or willingness to transport your country via tra certain transit states, right? So uh, countries which are export-oriented, and Russia for sure is export-oriented, country external environment. This international level of analysis is the key to understand uh, when and why this particular country goes. National level, at the national level, where we look at? We look at uh, geography. We look, uh, you know, the trade with neighbors is always easier than the trade with overseas countries because for delivering your goods to overseas countries you have to spend quite a lot. Uh, you have to create infrastructure, you need uh, to think about transportation costs, about the competitiveness of your goods, etc. So, uh, then you think about your historical legacy, about traditional friends and foes. Why friends and foes are important? It's a matter of trust. We don't trust our foes or former foes, and we trust those uh, who were traditional allies in uh, the big military conflicts, right? And think about Russia, how many friends Russia has on its per perimeter. As a country which expanded uh, uh, over land since uh, Middle Ages, Russia acquired quite a number of foes, right? And uh, it's not surprisingly that uh, geography is not very favorable, maybe with few exceptions. 
right? So that's why I think that for energy uh, sources, especially oil and gas, which are transported into LA via pipelines, the key issue is relationship with transit states, right? In our case, if you follow what's happening, it's Ukraine, it's Poland, maybe it's Belarus in the future, right? It's uh, Denmark, though Denmark is, uh, we do not have a, uh, a border, but uh, uh, Denmark has a say uh, in the decision about Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which is about to be built within this year. Then we look at business groups. You know, there is a, a saying in the United States, or at least it used to be a saying, what is good for Ford is good for General Motors is good for America. Can we identify key business players in Russia whose words is as important as it used to be for U.S. and its relationship with General Motors. Can we identify one, two, three single actors in business which, uh, which words cannot be ignored simply, right? Does business play any role in Russian foreign policy or domestic policy? So this is a, you know, a key issue to address, and I will do my best to look at this relationship between business and energy is part of Russian economy, part of Russian business, and for sure it's the biggest part of Russian business. And of course there are some other uh, business groups which we'll look at a little bit, because in the Russian economy cannot be reduced exclusively to energy sector, right? And of course there is a, a, a personal level, which is also important. There are ambitious politicians, presidents, prime ministers, kings, Wins and less ambitious. There are gifted people and less gifted people. There are, you know, we know. So we can take the United States, we can take Russia, we can take any other country. And uh, you will see the difference. So uh, the role of uh, uh, personalities in world politics, in uh, foreign policy of like any given state is, is tremendous, right? United States under Bush and under Obama. Right. The same capacity, the same geography, the same institutions, more or less, and you see absolutely different foreign policy and the shift with Trump. And from Yeltsin to Putin, and from Medvedev to Putin, the same, right? So, uh, so what is Putin, uh, Putin's take on Russia's energy sector? And uh, those who are interested, I would strongly advise you to look at uh, so-called Putin's thesis. This is a paper uh, 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 written by Harley Balzer from uh, George Town University about uh, maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, where he analyzes uh, Putin's uh, candidate dissertation, which was defended in St. Petersburg Mining Institute, not far away from, from, from this place, just another bank of Never River. When uh, Putin uh, lost elections alongside with boss uh, Anatoly Sobchak back to 1997. And what was the main point in this dissertation? which became basically a motto of his policy towards energy sector. In his dissertation, being jobless for a very short period of time before Putin moved to Moscow, he said that uh, energy sector is so vital to us that we have to keep commanding heights in energy sector at least for the next 40 years, right? At that time, uh, the structure of Russian energy sector was not as, uh, centralized uh, or uh, state controlled as today. At that time, you know, oil sector was uh, uh, dominated by private companies, uh, state-owned companies who basically did not, yeah, they, they did exist like Transnet, which was in charge for transportation of Russian oil, but the uh, on top list of Russian oil producers were private companies, not state-owned. But again, uh, Putin's take on this was that uh, we should use our comparative advantages and uh, we should think about vast resource-based Russia at, 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 at its disposal. And just to give you one figure, which is consensus figure by uh, international uh, private and non-private uh, uh, institutions about Russia's uh, mineral uh, resource base uh, in, in dollars, it's 75 trillion US dollars, 75 US trillion dollars. You can imagine it's oil, gas, coal, uh, uranium, and other ores of, of all kinds, 75 trillion. What is uh, United States GDP? Yeah. 
you know, just, just you know, you, you, you need, you know, some kind of uh, scale to understand that. Is it, is it, is it significant or is it absolutely nothing? So Russia's GDP is 1.5 trillion, 1.5. So mineral base is 75. You can, you can easily calculate. So it's uh, 60 times, right? 60 times Russia's current GDP. So which means that, uh, you know, Russia is so rich that it will be interesting partner for, for a number of years, for a number of countries who are thirsty in various mineral resources, including energy. That's why uh, the smart prince in Russia would think how to find those partners, how just to uh, monitor the situation on the world market, be it oil, coal, natural gas, and find and, uh, the way to those partners and make deals with them. Okay, so a personal level is a key. So what are main trends in the international system which are relevant to our subject, which are relevant to our energy sector and linked with Russia's foreign policy? Uh, first and foremost, it's emergence of new centers of demand, right? Because of growth of China, growth of India. Two-thirds in growth of consumption of crude oil today comes from China, right? So China basically uh, creates uh, demand for uh, oil today. And uh, China is number one trigger on the uh, world oil market. So if you use such terms as market power, of course the United States is number one because it produces uh, you know, you know, uh, as much as Saudi Arabia and a little bit more than Russia, but it consumes much more than both Saudi Arabia and, and, and Russia. But what about China? China is one of the biggest consumers. And China is ambitious. China goes through urbanization. China uh, uh, is developing various ways of transportation. So they, uh, by number of uh, new cars, China is number one consumer in the world. China, Chinese Navy and Chinese Army are extremely ambitious, right? And uh, fortunately, unfortunately, renewables cannot work if you would like to get access to high seas. If you build submarines, they will not run on batteries, right? So you need, uh, you need either a nuclear power station or you, you need a lot of uh, diesel, a lot of, uh, you know, traditional energy, right? So uh, for, for quite a while, taking into account Chinese economic growth of 6.5%, we can assume that China will be a uh, you know, very important player for, uh, for the world and for, for, for Russian energy. So new centers of demand, uh, China, India, and Asia in general. Secondly, shale gas or shale revolution in, in the United States. What does it mean? I, I think that most of you are well aware about you know, these developments in the States, uh, but the United States basically ceased to be the most important importer of oil from the Middle East. So what does it mean in uh, terms of uh, geopolitics? I, I wouldn't say that Middle East forgotten by the United States, but uh, definitely since Obama time, uh, Middle East uh, is lacking attention by the United States, right? U.S. is more or less uh, happy with the current situation, uh, uh, and Saudi Arabia has to think about new markets, right? To find new niches on the world market, and the same goes uh, uh, with, with Europe, which uh, gets absolutely unexpectedly uh, a, a new potential supplier from overseas, from the United States, which by chance ask a little bit more than Russia, maybe 30% more for its uh, natural gas. But nevertheless, you know, U.S. Uh, wants to become an uh, exporter, not exporter of natural gas, right? And we might assume, or we might uh, expect that uh, this competition for Europe between Russia and the United States will be quite intense. Of course, if you will have questions uh, in the future about potential uh, for U.S. experts, uh, we can discuss a bit later. Then, new issue, which uh, is not very worrying for this country because it's so vast and, uh, you know, population density except for two capitals is not as uh, big as in Europe. Uh, climate change 
agenda and global warming. Europeans are alarmed. Uh, people in Netherlands and Denmark and other countries and low countries, uh, you know, uh, expect the worst. But nevertheless, if we agree that uh, climate change is a, is a matter, is a big issue, if we think that uh, ecology in general is a global common good, we have to think how to diminish uh, emission of uh, CO2 or green gases, right? And uh, through this, you have to think about the general revision of the whole concept of energy consumption. I will not eat the bread of a colleague of mine, Maxim Titov, who will present his lecture on this. But in short, you have to think about renewables. You have to think about the most green energy sources. And natural gas is one of such kind of sources. When you consume natural gas, you emit substantially less CO2 than when you consume oil products. Basically, it's uh, universal and uh, absolutely uh, nature-friendly uh, source of energy. Or you have to think about nuclear power generation, right? So, and here Russia is very powerful and very strong. And I will uh, discuss later Russia's uh, potential and uh, Russia's capacity for exports of nuclear power uh, uh, stations. Yet another good news for Russia, that uh, Europe or European demands for natural gas with time being will grow. Today, uh, Europeans consume uh, 567 billion cubic meters of natural gas, which is substantially increase in comparison with what we had in, back to 2014. And uh, again, according not to only Russian Minister of Energy, but uh, uh, there is a consensus uh, among those who deal with, uh, with the future of energy, a growing demand in the EU for 2030, uh, 2040 will rise by about 80 billion cubic meters. And the, the key question is, who will deliver those 80 billion cubic meters? The United States does not have such capacity. For Qatar, Algeria, and some other countries in the North Africa, Europe is still not a premium market because they prefer to go to Japan and uh, uh, South Korea. And again, it's, it's a good opportunity for Russia to increase its exports to uh, Europe. Uh, national level. So here, again, I would like uh, to draw attention to one uh, uh, issue. Uh, you, we have to think about the role of Russia's energy sector in Russian economy in general, right? And we have to look at the structure. Whether we, Russian energy uh, companies belong to the states or fully controlled by the state, it's one thing, or sector is much more complicated by its structure. So, just on this slide, you see a lot of uh, figures, a lot of words, uh, ex exporting goods. Uh, but what is important? Uh, the slide, uh, the, the first slide, uh, tells us that mineral fuel, or fuels, including oil, constitutes the lion's share of Russian export. More than 52 percent. More than 52 percent. And uh, uh, one fourth of this account goes for uh, natural gas and three thirds, almost three thirds, for oil. Uh, it means that Russia is exporting not only mineral fuel, right? 48%, or roughly 47% uh, percent, uh, goes for other uh, goods. It's, uh, as you see, iron, steel, cereals, gems, machinery, woods, fertilizers, aluminum, copper, electrical machines, etc. So, in other words, you cannot reduce Russian economy to exclusively oil and gas and coal. It's much more complicated. That's why, you know, the thesis of those who say that Russia is a, just simply petrostate is wrong. Right? It's wrong. 
uh, not only by structure of Russian export, by, by the way how uh, Russian uh, energy sector uh, is performing. So, major export destinations, and uh, you know, uh, you know, it's it's self-evident that uh, those who produce and export would like to keep at least the status quo on the uh, major markets, right? Of course, you would like to increase your presence. Maybe you want to win new markets, but uh, uh, Russian oil, gas, coal is being traded mostly in Europe. More than 54% uh, of Russian energy sources go to Europe. And this is a very provocative thesis for you. So I would say that, I would argue that the Russian energy sector is in favor of partnership with Europe. It's, it's very simple. Because we make cash, we live quite good, we can meet here in Kazansky S7, you know, in quite comfortable conditions because, you know, it's paid by revenues from Russian energy sector. And the, the, the bulk of those money come from Europe, from Germany, from Italy, from France, from Netherlands, from Greece, etc. Uh, who's going second? Asia. Asia, namely China, India. China. And China is emerging as the most important single economic partner for Russia. If we look at the trades, general trade and export of Russia with all countries, China would be number one. And potential for growth is, is immense. So uh, you might know that the leaders of two countries set a goal to reach uh, 200 billion uh, US dollars uh, uh, level uh, within the next five or six years. Of course, if and when Russia finishes building its pipelines to transport natural gas, I think that it's, it's quite feasible. Africa is above North America and then Latin America. What does a figure tell you? That there is no uh, serious economic motives in Russian energy sector to work with Americans and vice right, versa. Right, so there is no economic interdependence between the most powerful business group in Russia and the United States of America. And this can tell you why we go from one crisis to another. Well, basically, there are no powerful lobbying groups on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean who would say that we have to be on good terms. Right? So this is, this is maybe, again, uh, people in international political economy would, uh, would agree with such kind of statements. Latin America with Venezuela, with our best friend Maduro, you know, on the, on, on, on the bottom of, of these uh, expert destinations. So a few words about Russia's energy sector in order to give you a feeling uh, about the subject, what we are talking about, and why Russia is not a petrol state yet. This, this is, I will defend uh, uh, again and again. So historically, it's homegrown. It's not like in Nigeria, it's not like in many other countries in the Gulf when uh, foreign companies, seven sisters, came with their money, with their technology, with their engineers, and uh, started from scratch and built huge uh, facilities uh, which up to now produce uh, oil and uh, to some extent oil products. Uh, it's homegrown. We have, uh, you know, quite good uh, mining schools, engineering, uh, education, geologists, maybe not the worst for sure in the world. Uh, and by the way, this horizontal drilling, which is essential for shale gas revolution, uh, uh, first was uh, tried successfully in Russia by one Armenian uh, technician many years ago in the 50s when he approached the uh, then uh, Soviet Ministry for Petroleum they said okay what are production costs for this uh, technology they said okay it's three folds higher than in traditional oil sector and he said okay we can wait and we waited till uh, till recently though you know in terms of uh, engineering uh, capacity and capabilities. Uh, this horizontal drilling, the fracking, uh, was uh, uh, basically became a part of Russian uh, uh, 
education in uh, mining schools back to late 50s. For structure, it's centrally governed uh, and well diversified. What does it mean centrally governed? So the state plays a key role in the way how energy sector works. It's not liberal. <laughs> It's not, uh, and as a result, there are a lot of preferences for state-owned companies, for Gazprom and Rosneft, especially for offshore uh, business. Private companies are not allowed to work offshore, especially in the Arctic, for ecological reasons and for some other reasons. Uh, few companies are allowed to export. In case of natural gas, it's Gazprom. In case of LNG, you know, uh, there is, it's, it's Novatec, uh, recently built uh, company. But in, in general, Russian energy sector is well diversified. What does it mean? It means that, uh, again, uh, uh, some countries enjoy a lot of sun. Russia enjoys a lot of various types of mineral resources. So we have a lot of natural gas, and if you look at Russia's energy mix, 52% in uh, 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 prime generation of electricity comes from natural gas, 52. So, uh, you know, most countries in Europe would dream about this, which means emission of CO2 by using natural gas is minimal. Then Russia has a lot of oil, you know, uh, number three producer, 11, million barrels per day, you know, Saudi Arabia is able to produce 12.5, the United States is producing 11.5. Others are uh, capable to produce no more than 4.5, like Iraq today. So Russia is on, on, on top. Uh, then we produce a lot of coal. I don't know whether you are familiar with the, the fact that Russia is number three exporter of coal. We're exporting 190 million tons of coal per annum. Number three, only Australia and Indonesia are uh, above Russia. And other countries are uh, you know, quite low in, in this ranking. What else? Russia, one of the uh, number five in terms of uh, uh, generation electricity by hydropower. Number five. While we export electricity, uh, not as much as other countries, we are number 12 in the world with just uh, 640 million US dollars. But potential is huge. Just imagine uh, if we know the countries which are ready to buy Russian electricity, you can build simply uh, medium-sized nuclear power stations and transport your electricity Why? electricity grids, you don't need pipelines. And uh, what Russia is, uh, is going to do to build nuclear power station in Kaliningrad, Königsberg, former Königsberg in Germany. So there will be access to Baltic Sea, and I will, you know, uh, I can only guess what kind of competition can emerge in this region with uh, uh, cheap Russian electricity. I, I'm not sure that anyone will be able to compete when it's electricity generated by nuclear power stations. So, uh, all in all, uh, why this uh, well-diversified energy mix is so important? You can easily switch from one energy to another if you see uh, a chances to make money on foreign markets. For instance, if uh, prices of natural gas go up, you can just increase uh, uh, export of natural gas. If prices on natural gas go down on external markets, you can use it domestically. And there are, uh, you know, good incentives uh, for Russian uh, energy sector since domestic markets are going uh, quite fast closer to world, mar uh, world market prices, be it oil, be it uh, electricity, or be it natural gas. So they actually risen fivefold since 2008. I mean, natural gas. Very, very close to uh, world prices. So, uh, Russian energy sector is uh, extremely flexible in terms of fuel consumption. 
but as I said, is less flexible in terms of exports. Why? Because uh, uh, Russia does not want to uh, have a situation of unnecessary competition between Russian gas being sold by two Russian companies, let's say, in Europe. Why to create this uh, competition? Let, let us have just one exporter, Gazprom. In case of oil, of course, there are many uh, exporters. In case of coal, the same story. And, uh, of course, uh, Russia's energy sector is more than just business. Uh, I don't know, those who are familiar with Russian realities, uh, we have such a uh, saying as social responsibility of business. Social responsibility, which means that uh, energy companies should take care about football teams, Gazprom is everywhere, Gazprom Neft is everywhere, you know, tennis games, ice hockey games, football, etc. You know, all those uh, sports and soft power in the end of the day, right? Soft power. If your ice hockey team wins Olympic Games, it uh, gives you visibility, right? But without support of sports, you cannot win anything. So in Russian case, uh, the way to increase soft power goes through generous support by energy companies. So uh, there are three major functions of energy in, in Russia in general. First of all, it's uh, the, the strongest pillar of Russian economy. The, the most important sector in Russian economy. Uh, it's the foundation of Russia's power and ambition in the long run. Uh, export routes, especially to Asia, to China, serve as main drivers for regional development including remote areas, right? Uh, for instance, uh, there is a debate, big debate uh, in Russia and the international community that Russia and China won't be able to find a compromise on price on Russia's natural gas because Chinese are very tough negotiators. They are not ready to pay the same price as Europeans. Uh, and of course, they negotiate from position of strength. They use, let's say, natural gas from Turkmenistan is a benchmark in negotiations with Russia. And Turkmen's sell their gas for cheap, right? But if you uh, keep in mind that this pipeline will go through nine Russia's regions in the Far East, and industries and people in those regions will get access to electricity, to natural gas and electricity, and there will be chances for economic development and revival of this uh, remote areas. You, your take, your perception of importance of this pipeline to China will be different. So basically by building this pipeline, Russia is saving these uh, remote areas and uh, is trying to give yet another chance for Russian forests to uh, become uh, developed. And finally, the third major function of energy is uh, it's one of most powerful foreign policy tools in a positive way. So if you are France, you can get subsidy. You can get certain discounts. That's Belarus. They do not pay, despite all claims by Alexander Lukashenko, a Belarusian president, the same price as Germans. They pay substantially less. Armenia pays substantially less. And basically all countries which are member states of Eurasian uh, Economic Union pay substantially less than uh, other countries. Uh, in all debates about climate change, whether Russia will join, whether Russia will ratify or not, it's also political, there is a political uh, issue. Why Russia is important in terms of climate change dialogue? Because Russia is uh, uh, one of the biggest emitters of uh, greenhouse gases. Of course, it's well behind the US, it's well behind China, but it's on the top of this list. And uh, basically, if you know uh, history of those uh, climate change debates, Russia basically saved the other protocol 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago, when Russia ratified Kyoto Protocol and uh, it became possible 
to become uh, this kind of pro protocol a legally binding law for, for, for countries, uh, for member states. Basically, Russia at that time, and Putin uh, in particular, has saved uh, coalition in Germany led by a Chancellor Schroeder. Because for him, for Schroeder, this was a key issue for his uh, domestic politics and foreign policy. Right? So, uh, climate change agenda might be a political issue. Of course, not today, but Russia, unfortunately, still views it through the prism of uh, uh, high politics. And uh, uh, quite important thing uh, related to foreign policy uh, goes to new type of relationship with OPEC and Saudi Arabia in particular. I don't know whether, just let me go to one. Yeah, it's not here. Just, sorry. Uh, uh, you might know that uh, uh, Russia is not uh, the only producer of oil. I already made this point, right? Uh, how much the world economy consumes uh, of oil per day? 85, 90 uh, million barrels, right? With 11 million of your production, you cannot be a price maker, right? You are a price taker which means that you are over-dependent on the fluctuation on, on the uh, world oil markets. And uh, during Soviet times, when the USSR was able to produce more than the current Russia, right? when the uh, USSR was uh, substantially stronger in general terms, uh, Moscow was an easy victim of price wars initiated by OPEC and Saudi Arabia. And basically, when uh, the Soviet Union has invaded Afghanistan, what was the reaction by uh, Saudis and the West in general, Saudis in particular? They offered uh, the markets extra volumes of oil, and oil dropped from 32 bucks per barrel to eight dollars per barrel. Fourfold drop, which basically put Russia on knees, and Russia was not able to feed its Allies and Warsaw Pact, Russia was not able to uh, keep status quo in its economy uh, domestically, etc., etc. Solidarność has emerged in Poland and there was a huge unrest on the Soviet periphery as a result of inability to feed this periphery, periphery from Russian soil. What do we see today? What do we see today? More or less, you know, the same setting, right? Fortunately, Russia is not in Afghanistan, Russia is in Syria, but Russia uh, decided to find ways to cooperate with Saudis. And Saudis, you know, for some reasons, I don't know if we have time, if you're interested, we might discuss this issue, were willing to make a compromise and to agree on substantial cuts in production of oil. And as a result of deal with Saudi Arabia and OPEC, Russia and OPEC managed to make a deal about so-called OPEC Plus. And through this move, Russia became one of the most important price makers on the oil market. So you see a difference. In Soviet times, price taker and playing from position of weakness, and today, you know, different story. I wouldn't or exaggerate, you know, achievements by, you know, Saudis and Russians. But nevertheless, we see more or less stable uh, prices on oil, which uh, gives uh, Putin and uh, uh, Saudis uh, enough revenues. So on this slide, you see Russia's energy in the global context. Uh, I, I'm sure that organizers, uh, European University will send will email you this presentation and you will be able to see in detail because, you know, they, there is a lot of data. But what is said uh, that Russia's energy in the global context uh, is, uh, is, 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 is very important. In every, particular, in every single sector, be it oil, be it natural gas, be it coal, and the situation is not changing uh, for us, uh, for, for the country. 
So some uh, uh, data for you about production and exports of energy goods from Russia from 2017 to 2018. So what happened over the last year? Where the sanctions work in a way as uh, the West was willing when they imposed those sanctions back to 2014? It seems they don't work this way. So if you look at the production of oil and the uh, export of Russian oil, you see that there is increase uh, despite an arrangement with OPEC about cuts by 1.6%, and Russia is still number two in terms of uh, export of oil with uh, about $180 billion of, of, of export, right? So oil gives Russia the lion's share of the export you know, revenues. Natural gas, you see even more uh, serious increase in production by 5%, right? And this 5% resulted in an increase also of uh, exports to Europe. And uh, this year, last year, 2018, was a record year for Russian exports to Europe. 200 billion cubic meters. More than one third of natural gas which Europeans consume come from Russia. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, financial uh, results, it's almost 60 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, coal, again, so, so you, when you read uh, foreign press, you can hardly find any information about any clashes about Russian coal, right? But uh, again, Russia is one of the biggest uh, exporters of coal, and uh, Russian miners make 13.5 billion US dollars in exporting coal to our foreign countries. It's also quite a substantial amount of cash. In terms of electricity, Russia is number, uh, uh, number 17. Here you see uh, 10 major export companies uh, which are still profitable. And uh, you see Lukoil, Sorgutny, Aftigas, Novatek, uh, which are private companies. And again, uh, this slide uh, would inform you about uh, the fact that Russian economy is not fully centralized. There are many heavyweights in the energy sector which are pri privately owned. And even in the state-run companies, and if you look at the uh, composition of board of directors, the lion's share of people coming from the West, right? So with Western degrees, with Western experience. Because the key issue to have trust with those who are ready to invest in your country, who are ready to share technology, who are ready uh, to open up new markets. So again, despite sanctions against all those companies, they make profits. Though uh, in some cases profits are uh, not as substantial as the year before, but even Novatek, which uh, put in line uh, Yamal LNG a year ago, uh, made 2.2 billion uh, dollar profit. So main features of Russia's energy, and again, why we can talk about the strong link between uh, energy and uh, foreign policy. It's export oriented. It's export oriented. Uh, it depends on markets, it depends on transit states, it depends on investors, technology, and a special relationship with competitors. Again, those who come or came from uh, former Soviet Union, especially from Central Asia, you know, uh, there are several competitors with Russia on European and global markets because they can offer uh, the same products. Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, they can offer natural gas, they can offer oil. And how to deal with those uh, competitors? You know, of course, it's a nightmare scenario when uh, Russian oil will meet with Kazakh oil uh, on, the, on the global market, or when natural gas from Turkmenistan will go to Europe. So uh, that's why there should be a lot of diplomacy. There should be a lot of arrangements to aim at different markets, right? And not to uh, knock on the same door to create unnecessary competition. Yet another uh, main feature of Russia's energy is, uh, is the need for the diversification of natural gas uh, export. So Russia is 
uh, extremely depends on the EU as a market. Extremely depends, right? So basically, the lion's share of money Gazprom makes come, comes from, from, from Europe. Uh, sometimes uh, we uh, here in Russia, you know, just getting astonished by the fact that uh, the Western Europeans discussing the scenario when uh, Gazprom will decide to stop deliveries of natural gas to Europe. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, if, if, if Gazprom decides to commit a suicide, yes, it's a possible scenario, but those who control Gazprom, uh, I mean the Ministry of uh, uh, Energy uh, and the government generally will never allow them to do so. That's why China. That's why uh, LNG, that's why Yamal LNG, that's why Arctic LNG, in order to have an opportunity to go beyond Europe, not to be over-dependent on one uh, market. And the whole strategy of development of Russian uh, uh, liquefied natural gas is about this, it's about diversification. Right, and uh, the goal is to uh, reach 10% uh, share on LNG markets. Uh, in seven years, in, in 2025. Uh, yet another feature is, uh, of Russia's energy sector is relatively high production costs. Uh, when we talk about oil in particular, if prices on oil drop, who will win? Those who, whose production costs are lower, right? So, uh, if you want to understand Russia's interest to Middle East, it's not just philanthropic interest. Likewise, Americans never had philanthropic interest to Middle East, maybe except for State of Israel. Uh, Russia's interest to Middle East, to Iraq, Iran, to Saudi Arabia, to Emirates, to Libya in particular, two weak states basically, two weak states, is because production costs in those countries are substantially lower than in, in, in Russia, in Russian brownfields or in Russian greenfields, etc. If you want to explain yourself in an economic way, so-called multi-vectorness of Russian foreign policy, why Russia started in the 90s from Europe and then diversified its interest uh, across the globe, you should think about diversification of business interests of major players, of uh, energy companies in particular. In our case, it's uh, oil sector. So, uh, external dimensions of Russia's energy trade. As I said, Russia is uh, the leading uh, uh, supplier of oil and gas to Europe, right? So, basically, Europe is uh, over-dependent, and maybe the discussions at the European Commission about Russia as, uh, as, as a key partner uh, have uh, serious grounds. And the share of Russia on the European market is not decreasing by increasing. And this is also uh, a medical fact. Since 2016, Russia uh, exported more oil than Saudi Arabia. And again, uh, if you look uh, at oil, Russia's oil sector, three quarters of oil is exported. Three quarters of what we produce is exported. And one quarter, uh, one third, I'm sorry, one third of uh, gas is uh, also exported. I will skip this. In terms of export capacity, and for how long Russia can play this card, for how long Russia might be as important as it is for Europe, uh, for China, and for other countries. In terms of coal, in terms of uh, its, uh, Russia's uh, reserves, uh, Russia can uh, produce uh, as much as we produce today for another 30 to 40 years, actually. It's, it's very stable, and I think that Russia will keep this third position uh, 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 in terms of uh, exporters for quite a while. In terms of natural gas, Russia can produce uh, 900 billion cu cubic meters per annum. That's a capacity, according to Ministry of Energy estimates. Today we produce 725. So we can produce, uh, Russia can produce uh, uh, additional 175 billion cubic meters. 
which means that if Chinese are ready to buy Russian gas and the Europeans will keep the same level of consumption, Russia can work on both uh, markets. And uh, what is missing, again, in all debates about Russia's energy? It's uh, Russia's nuclear sector, uh, nuclear power plants. If you look at Ross Adam webpage, and I will uh, go uh, uh, immediately to, uh, yeah, to Ross Adam uh, as one of the key actors in the energy sector. Uh, it's uh, underestimated in whole debates about uh, Russia's energy. But what happens basically? When you have a lot of petrodollars, when you have a lot of cash, the key issue how to how you use those uh, petrodollars, right? You can just uh, uh, increase standards of living in the country, you can increase pensions, you can, can increase social benefits, you can uh, increase space to Siloviki, etc., to the military, and you can enhance your constituency base, but the expectations will rise uh, year by year, right? So it's a very risky thing, right? Another thing is uh, to create or to, to use those petrodollars to create lasting dependencies with the key markets, with the key countries, with the key partners. And uh, uh, basically what uh, uh, Russians are, are doing for the last maybe 15 years, and I think that this, is, this was missed by a lion's share of uh, experts in the West, Russia was investing these uh, billions of dollars into building nuclear power stations abroad, right? So why this is important? Because uh, just think, with new technology of building nuclear power reactors, you create dependencies for a century, not just for 20 years, not just for 30 years. When you build pipeline, you know, today you can uh, transport you oil or natural gas tomorrow, you know, there will be uh, another provider with a cheaper uh, producer of oil and gas, right? Oh, look at Ukraine, what's going to happen with the, the uh, transportation system? I'm not sure that it, it will survive uh, within the next 10 years. Uh, but when you build nuclear power station, first of all, you build it for five years, then you this power station will be in operation for another 70 years or 75 years. Uh, the country which built this pipe uh, with this power station will have to provide maintenance services to work with uh, spent fuel, right? And then uh, to decommission it. And this is a century. And by building those uh, uh, units, you create enormous dependencies. You cannot just, you know, forget about uh, the nuclear power station on your soil, right? It's a huge risk. So uh, once you made a decision, once you uh, received an investment from, in our case, Rosatom or Russia, you uh, will be in the same boat. And again, if you look at the map of uh, uh, contracts, of Rosatom, you will be astonished that there are many countries in Asia, there are many countries in Europe. Turkey is also on this map, and uh, you know, I think uh, Rosatom is a major in the future, the major, uh, one of the major instruments or uh, ambassadors of Russia's energy sector. Uh, uh, today, uh, in the portfolio of uh, Russia, there are 26 reactors. 26. And uh, I think that who competes with Russia on this market? South Korea, to some extent China, and to some extent France. But South Koreans over depend on US technology. Chinese are uh, not as advanced as Russians in uh, technology yet and uh, uh, French area is too expensive. So I might guess that this portfolio of contracts for Rosatom will, will increase with time being. 
Okay, so what is goal of Russia? I think it's, it's, my, it's, it's, it's my assessment of the situation, my evaluation of the situation. So Russian uh, government so far was capable to use uh, comparative advantages of almost all energy subsectors, be it coal, oil, gas, nuclear, in order to avoid uh, 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 unnecessary competition. Right? So, uh, in order to avoid the situation when Russian coal in Europe would uh, compete with Russian natural gas. Right? So, and the dirigism in foreign policy trade is a must today. So, that's why the role of states, the role of uh, uh, Ministry of Energy uh, is key. So, we should know uh, uh, market flows. Good management. In private companies, yes, we can uh, talk about good management uh, on the company's level. And uh, instead of uh, several national energy companies, which would sing as solo and uh, play for their own interest, uh, for their selfish interest, uh, we see uh, that the state is capable to uh, creates, you know, I would, I would say, quite good orchestra. In conclusion, I'm sure that energy will be the key business group in both domestic and foreign policy of Russia. Uh, I think that uh, it strongly supports multipolarity or multivectorness of Russian foreign policy. Uh, Europe will remain the key actor, and I would say uh, energy is a key stabilizer for Russian-European relations. Despite all, you know, myths and uh, speculations in Brussels and elsewhere, and I think that Chancellor Merkel uh, uh, got the point when she, uh, she, she, she's, is, uh, when she uh, claimed that she's in favor of uh, this uh, Nord Stream 2 project. Uh, but uh, with time being, of course, uh, Russian energy sector will be more and more inclined to go Asia, and uh, China, with time being, will become as important as Europe. For Soviet space, uh, again, two functions are important. Potential competitors, that's why Russia should be on good terms with Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, and, uh, Turkmenistan. Russia cannot spoil the relationship. And, with those countries, and Russia cannot lose those countries to uh, its uh, geopolitical partners, as Mr. Putin would say. And of course, OPEC Saudi Arabia will remain a crucial partner uh, for Russian uh, oil sector. So I will stop and will be ready and happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Excuse me? Uh, Petro Yuan. Petrodollar, China and Russia have created a collaborative currency. I'm sure that uh, uh, of course one of the reasons of US predominance in world economy is the fact that dollar is a world currency, right? So it's, uh, it's for sure. And I think that uh, for the time being, uh, all projects, in my humble opinion, to avoid using dollar and trade for oil when both currencies, Russian ruble and yuan, are not very stable, it would mean losses for both sides. It might be done if the uh, relationship between Russia and U.S. and uh, U.S. and China uh, would deteriorate dramatically. It would be unavoidable, but uh, taking into account the willingness of China to normalize trade relations with uh, the with United States and to make a compromise. And if you follow what's happening in China these days, you would see that the tone is rather soft. And Russia is also not looking for uh, uh, you know, additional uh, 
reasons for deterioration of relationship with Washington. So I would say it's, it's, it's rather rhetoric. Uh, there might be minor contracts, just uh, a gesture. That's uh, when we talk about big uh, projects and big contracts. I think that they will be uh, signed in, uh, not necessarily in dollars, it might be euro. It might be, you know, Swiss francs, it might be, you know, <laughs> British pounds. <laughs> so, not necessarily dollars, but it will be uh, a currency, world currency, for sure. So, I don't know whether I answered your question. Well, in your part in Germany debates about the European dependency on Russian energy, because a lot of politicians fear that it's, uh, the, European ener the Russian energy comes with a lot of political influence. Do you think this fear is fair, or is it just Russophobia? Uh, you, know, you know, as a historian, I would say, uh, uh, I think that we have to look at history and uh, find uh, cases when Russia has used uh, energy as a weapon. Gazprom, to the best of my knowledge, uh, never tried to do so, and uh, because it's self-evident what happened with OPEC when OPEC used oil embargo. It lost its credibility, right? And uh, the whole wave of changes and innovations in the West took place afterwards. You know, and uh, Russia has emerged as a uh, uh, natural gas power exactly after oil embargo. So uh, Russia is well aware about such kind of uh, uh, accusations. Mm, uh, if you just look at Ukrainian crisis, right, when Russia stopped deliveries of natural gas to Ukraine, again, there is a big literature on this. Who was guilty, whether uh, uh, Russia was willing to punish uh, you know, democratic Ukraine for, you know, choosing a wrong path, etc. There were no contracts signed by Ukraine. Right? Ukraine, you know, basically believed that Russia uh, uh, would sign a contract on Ukrainian terms because uh, according to arrangement between Russia and the European Union at, at that time, as you might know, uh, the, the full responsibility for delivery of natural gas to Europe uh, via Russia, not Ukraine, right? Today's situation is different. But again, as I said, uh, historical memory is a strong uh, issue. We should not ignore. And history still covers relationship with some European countries. Baltic states, you know, uh, you know that Lithuania even decided uh, to build uh, this LNG terminal called Liberty, not to be 100% dependent on Russia. And they're ready to uh, pay extra 30% for uh, LNG from Norway just to be on the safe side. So, of course, there are countries uh, which are ready to pay extra price for uh, security. Uh, but if volumes uh, are about dozens of billions of cubic meters, uh, it might translate in losing your uh, competitiveness, right? Especially for uh, industries in Germany. That's why I think, uh, well, you know, of course, uh, you know, Churchill at, at some point said, what is the formula uh, of energy security? Just the easiest formula of energy security, diversification. Diversification, you, you might know that. Uh, during the First World War, trying to uh, create mm, advantages for uh, British Navy, uh, Churchill, uh, who was in charge for, for the Navy at that time, decided to switch from coal to oil. And in Parliament there were debates, right? And people said, okay, you know, we have a lot of coal, but we don't have oil. And he said, you know, energy security is about diversification. If we have several countries to buy from, we are on the safe side. So think about Europe. Uh, if Europeans uh, uh, would find other suppliers, 
for the same price, why not? But you know, uh, these days we uh, follow negotiations between Bulgaria and, 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 and Russia uh, over building nuclear power station, over export of natural gas, but over building pipelines, etc. You know, the single biggest investor to Bulgarian economy is Russian Luke Oil. So what? Does it mean that Bulgaria, you know, gives calls to uh, Mr. Alek Perov, <laughs> chief uh, executive officer and owner uh, of Luke Oil in order to uh, make this move or another move? No, of course not. So uh, I think that, uh, again, again, history uh, tells us that uh, that's problem is quite reliable. In the case of oil, we never, we never heard about any clash between Russia and European companies, right? The same about coal. Few bad news about nuclear power stations. Only natural gas, uh, right, attracts our attention. But again, natural gas in terms for, for Russia and for Russian business is just one force of uh, export revenues. World sector is much more important uh, for, for, for Russia, for Russian economy. So real cash cow for, for Russian economy is oil sector, is not gas sector. So that's why I think that those, uh, those uh, concerns are a little bit exaggerated. But again, uh, it's about feelings, and feelings is very subjective. So <laughs> Russia has nothing to do with this. So only with time being when Russia would prove uh, year by year that its reliable partner and the situation can change uh, for better. I don't know what to say about the economy, global economy, which is linked directly to oil and gas. I don't know if there is another source of energy that would be more uh, effective, cost effective. And these two. Um, I, coming from South America, I must argue also about uh, what are the ecological consequences of this, you know, kind of um, chest war of oil and, uh, and gas because uh, there is the exchange of energy between uh, organisms, living organisms that are having a big impact in the world. So, I don't know if this has been assigned an economic value to it, but um, or what is, how the world is going to deal with this uh, problem of climate change. Um, and also there's uh, science behind uh, forests. Uh, when the role of science or forests will come to play to, into this uh, talk, when will this sum up the stability of, of different life forms on Earth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's not easy question, and I think that Maxim Titov would answer this question much better than me, but uh, what I can tell you, first of all, in, in terms of uh, using hydrocarbons as primary sources in Russia and in the world in general. In Russian case, uh, as you might know, Russians uh, switched to the highest level of uh, ecological safety for its gasoline. It's uh, uh, level five, right? So in terms of uh, emission, CO2 emission, uh, you know, Russia made a huge uh, progress, right? So when you go to a uh, gas station to fill your tank, you will see not only uh, Russian uh, uh, companies, but also the Western like Shell, uh, Stadwell, uh, etc., Nesta. So ecological standards are uh, really high. And people living here, they uh, got accustomed to good conditions because most of us, you know, uh, lived in Europe or visited Europe numerous times and this lifestyle of Europeans became a part of our identity as well. So we are not forced to ourselves, so to our children. So it's, 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 it's just first thing. Natural gas, uh, I would say it's, it's clean. It's rather clean. 
And again, uh, I don't know from which part of South America you came, but those who live here for a while in St. Petersburg, uh, who see snowfalls and uh, frost, etc., uh, up to the end of March at the minimum, uh, long winter and quite uh, devastating spring, which cannot come. Right, uh, you know, we live in the in the north, and we need uh, traditional sources of energy. You know, it's uh, again, the God gave you sun, <laughs> and the God gave us hydrocarbons. You know, <laughs> to be more or less in the same uh, comfortable uh, condition. So, uh, but it doesn't mean that Russia fully ignores ecology. That's not true. That's not true, but it's not as burning as for uh, Europeans. That's true. That, yet in other, so the time factor here is not felt the same way as uh, in, uh, let's say, like Western Europe, like in Amsterdam or in Germany. That's why we do not have uh, a party, political party, a strong political party, who would make green development the number one issue and its political platform. So basically we don't have you know, a strong Greens here. Uh, they're emerging, so various political parties put as number 10 or number 11 uh, climate change issues on their political agenda, but it's not a predominant issue, uh, it's, it's for sure. Uh, but again, uh, enlightened community, academia, are very much concerned and they speak uh, the same language, but it's very difficult, very difficult uh, to win support. And by the way, just to give you a hint, uh, the goal of optimists in the renewable energy in Russia would be to have 1.5% in Russia's energy mix by 2025, if I'm not mistaken. 1.5, not 4, not 10, not 50, right, like in some countries, because the climate uh, and uh, traditional sources and lobby. How you can create this uh, flourishing renewable sector when all niches are already occupied? How, let's say, wind parks can compete with nuclear power stations nearby St. Petersburg when the electricity would be much cheaper? How we can do this? So, uh, of course, it's a rhetorical issue and rhetorical question, but uh, my take on, on your question is yes, we are fully aware, but and then you, you can find <laughs> reasons to say why why not today. Uh -huh. uh, just to add a little bit of an answer, please come to next week's lectures because it's going to be exactly this topic about the energies and what is the climate strategy in Russia. So you're welcome to come to me and to Max and Tito who will present on this topic. Um, I guess we will have two more questions and short if possible. Unfortunately, uh, so, unfortunately, I have three questions, but I'll try to be as short as possible. I, I come from Russia, but I <coughs> had my master thesis written in uh, Holland and supervised by the Dutch professors, and I have slightly different uh, view on this uh, topic, let's say. But I will, uh, like, my questions will be <coughs> linked to your presentation. So, for, first question: Imagine that there is a theory of uh, Russian energy as a, a new weapon. But if there is a weapon, is there a war? That's my first question. And if there isn't a war, what, what's the essence of the relationship uh, between Russia and the entire world or uh, Russia and Europe in terms of the energy policy? Uh, question number two. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are three colors of Russian energy. It's a very interesting concept. And I, I, I think that there are more than just three, and maybe there are all 50 shades of, uh, of the colors of Russian energy policy. And I think, and in literature, there is one, at least one extra one, and this color is black, because there is also a concept of uh, <laughs> using energy policy as a resource blackmail. So, what do you think? Is, is there a resource blackmail, in fact, or not? And my third question, 
is about uh, the social responsibility concept. When I was in Europe, I had some lectures on social responsibility and it had nothing to do with Zenit or tennis performance, performances and something like that. I think uh, it's completely about different things and it's linked to the word social and society rather than uh, Zenit and their games. And what's your opinion? Is there any other link to the society in terms of social responsibility uh, rather than what you have mentioned in your presentation? Thank you. Okay, so first, uh, thanks, uh, and the uh, opinion from Netherlands might be different. And it's for sure the most liberal country in the world in all, in all thinkable ways. Uh, starting with your first question, it's not my theory. I, I said that in the literature, uh, there are those who believe that Russians are using energy as a weapon, right? Against, against Ukraine, for instance, and uh, the whole talks about whether Russia would sign a new deal on transit. Uh, it's a natural gas uh, to Ukraine is viewed as a, as a, as a, as a, as a way to uh, influence the current regime in Ukraine and uh, the fact that Russia postponed negotiations uh, is linked with, uh, uh, with expectation who will win, who will become the next president. So basically, this theory comes from uh, Margarita Palmanzella. Maybe my English is not good, and I made a mistake. But it was Margarita who said that Russia is using energy as a weapon, right? So there are many other uh, texts, and one of the book is well-oiled diplomacy. Well-oiled diplomacy, meaning that Russia is trying to buy sympathizers here and there by providing uh, discounts on its oil. Etc. Is it new when countries use sticks and carrots and its economic and foreign policy? Of course not. It's as old as the world, right? Sticks and carrots. And the energy is a carrot and maybe a stick. And Russia is not unique, right? You know, and Russia did not develop and, uh, you know, uh, advance this uh, uh, instrument. It's quite normal. And you cannot make a country to sell uh, your trading good for, for, for cheap. There is a world price, okay? If you're ready to pay for you know, this world price, you're, you're, you're protected by World Trade Organization rules. And Russia uh, orders uh, uh, so-called national regime with the WTO, since Russia is a member of WTO, from 2012. And in WTO, there is no single claim against discrimination of Russia's trade, trade partners by energy goods. Ukraine did not come to WTO and nobody else. So it's up to for, for your first question. Blackmail. What does it mean, blackmail? Again, it's, uh, blackmail means that I would like to, to reach something. I expect something. I make uh, a hint. So you know, again, you have to put on the table the evidence. You know, in our case, if you have any country in mind, this country should stood up and say, okay, you know, you know, we deal with these Russian uh, partners and they are trying to blackmail us. I don't see any evidence. And uh, the third question was, excuse me. About social responsibility. Social responsibility. Of course, when you are rich, and don't remember when you became rich, or especially when you come to a rich country, you take for granted that there are uh, companies and business who have a strong perception about social responsibility. But when you come to a country which just uh, went through three revolutions at once, political change, end of communism, end of uh, common economy, right, and end of uh, huge empire, federation, you uh, see absolutely different uh, situation. The country is in despair, right? And people uh, has to go through this despair, right? And these people need, you know, simply speaking, pleasures. And of course you find fat guys who make money using national resources and talk to them guys. 
Because you have to do something. You have to deliver. It's enough. You are already a billionaire. So I think that it's quite normal. It's, it's on top of, of iceberg. But uh, seriously speaking, those companies are the biggest taxpayers in Russia. So this is social responsibility. And then, of course, I, I'm sorry that I missed this point. I had to say it. Uh, they are biggest taxpayers in Russia. Biggest. Ross, Neft, Gazprom, they pay more than anybody else. And in addition to this, from the uh, money, those billionaires, they use their cash to support, because some of them like ice hockey, some of them like football, some of them, etc. And for Gazprom, of course, it's a uh, uh, market strategy. So how to convince Germans that Gazprom is not a evil and not going to blackmail someone someday, right? So you have to sponsor Schalke 04. You have to come into every German house with Gazprom money to convince ordinary Germans because the Schalke 04 is much more popular than Bayern Munich, if I, if I understood correctly the German setting in football. So, and you sponsor uh, Champions League, you sponsor uh, those issues, and also it's a marketing strategy. And I'm sure that we're standing maybe in five years from now, there will be other types of business people who will uh, perceive uh, social responsibility in a different way. Of course, this, this line is a, a simplification, and don't take it for at face value. Thank you. Chinese Belt and Road, how that in, is being influenced in Russia or anywhere else that Russia is involved. If you know anything about that, is that anything to do with the energy policy in Russia? Uh, Silk, Silk Road, you mean? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, so of course it's, it's another thing which I uh, uh, had to mention. Of course, um, uh, Russia became a part of uh, ambitious Chinese uh, Silk Road project. And uh, you might know that Northern Sea Route was, in, was included by Chinese last June, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, into uh, our Chinese strategy to deliver their goods uh, to Europe, to link to markets Asian and European. And it's, of course, a good news uh, for Russia because it means that Chinese would also provide political and economic assistance to develop on the Russian Arctic region. Uh, Chinese play an enormous role in development of Russian Arctic uh, and uh, Yamala and GCNPC has 25%, and uh, yeah, the second project in the same region, uh, uh, Arctic LNG, will be supported by Chinese as well as, uh, as far as I know. So, uh, yes, yes, uh, that's true. Uh, China is becoming not only bio Russian uh, energy resources, but also uh, creates. Uh, uh, additional conditions for transportation of Russian goods in both directions to uh, Europe and uh, to, to Asia. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you.